Now available in paperback and e-readers, Isis, Samurai Goddess, The Goddess Next Door takes on Kung Fu Killers in this action-packed martial arts Isis series adventure. Get Isis, Samurai Goddess, in paperback and e-readers today. One of my regular YouTube viewers and regular blog readers, Kitty Kennedy, asked me to do an interview with her about a book, Between the World and Me, which is written by Tanishi Coates. And she's presented me with several written questions, and I'm going to answer them in this video and in a blog that I'm going to be posting this Friday. And the first question she proposes is, the book Between the World and Me is one that heavily focuses on the plight of African Americans in America. As a black man, do you feel that racism is one of the biggest challenges you face? If not, what are the top three? While I do believe that racism is still a major challenge for every black person to overcome, I do not believe that it is the biggest one. While racism is a major obstacle in the face of every black person in America, I believe that the bigger challenges African Americans face have to do with intraracial issues. And what is an intraracial issue? These are race issues related to African Americans in the, and their interactions with each other. Because some of the biggest problems African Americans face are not with white and non-black people, but with other black people. Now, the first major challenge I see African Americans like myself facing are dealing with the dysfunctional way many African Americans think. And as I see it, many African Americans are spellbound by the idea that the white man's ice is colder and they have to fit themselves into a black box to be the version of black that is supposed to be considered acceptable to whites. This is something I went in depth in on, in my recent novel, Spellbound where I talk about how a lot of African Americans believe that they have to fit themselves into a single box and be a certain type of black person that is considered acceptable to white people. And they find other black people who decide they don't want to fit into the mainstream ideas regarding black people. They want to bully these people. They want to attack these people. And ironically, they want to say that these same people who want to pursue their idea of what black culture is are acting white. And because of this way that these black people are thinking, this is one of the obstacles black people are going to face. And this way of thinking pretty much, you know, holds black people back. And again, I see this in my own experiences on social media and when I go out to promote books. Because as a writer, you know, when you're trying to do ideas that are outside of the box, you're going to run into a lot of resistance. I mean, for example, when I'm writing a and promoting a book, promoting things like in Spellbound and in Spinsterella that promote something like the African-American goth subculture, what I usually run into are people who want to make generalizations about the black people who have been a part of the goth subculture and say that they are devil worshippers, they worship Satan, and none of this is true at all. This is all because this person is exploring a, a part of black culture that is outside of the mainstream and does not fit into the traditional concepts regarding black culture. I also run into this whenever I promote an ISIS series book. Now, a lot of people cannot deal with the whole concept of African American fantasy and science fiction, and whenever they see a fantasy character, they take the character and they try to make it fit their ideas regarding black culture. And when it comes down to the Isis character, instead of seeing this character who is rooted in Egyptian and Nubian mythology, what they do is they boil the character down into the issue of light skin, dark skin, and then go into a light skin, dark skin, straw man argument and use that as an excuse not to try the books or to try to take a look at the material. Now, the second major challenge I face in my, in my life um, these days has to do with interracial issues as well. And that is having to try to show people that there is a world outside of the black box. And as a writer of positive black fiction and genres such as African American fantasy and stories about uh, other parts of the African American community, 
such as black sororities, like in my novel The Thetas, and the goth subculture in both Spinsterell and Spellbound, I run into African Americans who think that several subscribe ways that are to be called so-called, there's only several subscribe ways to be so-called authentic black, and that there are, black people don't have the freedom to be whatever they want to be and live how they want to live. According to these people, you're not an authentic black person or a real black person if you don't subscribe to certain concepts such as the hotep, the pro-black, or the street guy. For them, this is the only way to be considered a real black person, not to mention the Uncle Tom or, you know, the clean-cut black person. For them, there is no such thing as an African-American who likes comic books. Um, that's considered acting white. A African-American likes the goth subculture. That's considered acting white. And anyone who likes science fiction and fantasy, that's considered acting white. Or someone who likes art or music or things like that, they consider this person to be acting white because they want to go outside and explore a world and do things that aren't considered traditionally quote-unquote black when there's nothing wrong with that at all. All that is is a person expressing the liberties they have as American citizens, the liberties that they gained with the Civil Rights Movement, which was supposed to give us the right to go out and have the freedom to pursue our own lives, our own liberty, and pursue our own happiness. And when it comes down to the black community, again, this interracial struggle many African Americans face is dealing with people telling them that they have to live inside a limited environment inside of that black box and conform to these imaginary standards which keep them believing that stereotypes are normal behavior for African Americans when they have the freedom to do whatever they want and be whoever they want. Now the third major challenge I see African Americans facing is dealing with resistance towards anyone who thinks to do for themselves. Again, because many African Americans are spellbound and believe the white man's ice is colder, they believe anyone who does for themselves cannot be trusted. Because they think this way, they don't want to support a product created by a black person or a business owned by a black person. And I've run into this myself with the SJS Direct Publishing imprint. Sometimes when I would present books to people, what people would do is they would question the integrity of the product and they would go out of their way to find excuses not to buy it. And meanwhile, a white person or a non-black person could produce a similar product and these people would be eager to go out to buy them and they would sit there and say that there's something wrong with this black product and that really, again, hampers things because if we do not, do not support the people who are out to do for ourselves, we're not going to have a strong black community. Because in order for black people to grow as a people, we have to support the people who are out here making efforts to do for themselves. Because the people who are out here trying to do for self, these are the people who are going to create businesses for our community, and they're going to make efforts to hire our people, and they're going to help build the black community. Unfortunately, most African Americans are spellbound and believe the white man's ice is colder, so they're not going to trust the black people who are taking time to use their resources to help them by creating po products like I do, such as positive black fiction, or products made by other black people that would help move the community forward. The second question she proposes is that there is a heavy focus on the black victim narrative throughout the book that I have spoken about, and she asked me if I feel if these books are still relevant today or do they seem redundant in the African-American literary genre? Well, I'm going to answer this question very simply. There is a purpose for them uh, from a historical perspective. And what they do is they give us an insight into some of the thinking that people had uh, many years ago and an understanding of how they were thinking at that time. However, I don't that believe that these books are socially and culturally relevant anymore, you know, from a social or a cultural standpoint. From a historical standpoint, yes, but when it comes down to our social and cultural relevance to today, not really. Because what's the big problem is, is that this whole victim narrative really hasn't helped African Americans grow as a people and has stagnated their progress 
over the last 50 years. And what, many, what makes many of these books redundant is the fact that we have numerous authors continuing to rehash the same points over and over again. And these arguments in these books and these themes uh, in these books, you know, most of them have been refuted with facts and statistics. And when it comes down to this whole victim narrative, there comes a point where a person has to stop being a victim and start being a survivor. And this was a hard lesson I learned back in Park West High School in 1989, late 1989 and 1990. Now, back in late 89, I got mugged on a train, and this was in November. And I quickly learned that, you know, there comes a point where you have to stop being a victim. You have to stop, you know, wallowing in self-pity, and you have to pick yourself up. And I did that when I changed schools from Park West High School to Taft High School. And I started making those steps towards moving my life ahead. And eventually, again, you reach a point where you hit this rock bottom. And this is something I talk about in my screenplay, All About Maryland, um, where you have to start picking up and moving ahead. Because there comes a point where you have to stop being a victim and start being a survivor. And when it comes down to the African-American community, we have been wallowing in self-pity for so long about concepts such as racism, white supremacy, and other things that we're not moving ahead. These issues with racism and, and white supremacy, they are always going to be there, but we are going, always going to have to persevere. This is something our ancestors understood at, during Jim Crow. Unfortunately, most modern African-Americans don't seem to understand, you know, this concept that we're going to have to persevere. We're going to have to get up and do for self, even if there is racism out here. And we're going to have to start focusing on solutions. And this is something, again, that I learned back in late 89. And I continue to learn, you know, as far as 2008, when I lost a civil service job, you know, due to the chicanery of a Jewish man and a pro so-called pro-black female. And as I see it, you know, you have to continue persevering in spite of that, because that's what God told me to do. He told me to keep going. And even though I had lost that job, you know, the di Sunday before, he told me to just keep going. And I have to keep going because you can't stay a victim. Victims, you know, stuff happens to them. But what makes a person really strong is their ability to start being a survivor and overcoming what has happened to them. And as I see it, you know, books are supposed to be about a solution. The goal of a good book is to help someone learn more about something and give them information that's going to help them move their lives forward. Now, an example of this is one of my novels called The Thetas. Now, in the book The Thetas, I pretty much have this young girl, the Colleen character, who wants to be a part of, who is reluctant about being a part of a sorority because she is a feminist. And she sees this sorority as, you know, not helpful to women. But as we read the Thetas novel, we start to see how this sorority really helps black women. We start to see, you know, how they teach about culture. And in some ways, they give this Colleen character back her dead mother, who she never had a relationship with. And in, in that story, you know, we see a solution to a problem. This girl learns about um, how not to judge people who come from a different black culture. And she learns about how to have relationships with women um, who aren't part of her social group. And in the story, people learn more about black sororities and they learn more about black culture. And another book that I do um, that features a solution is the novel Spellbound, where this Matilda character is being bullied and told that she has to be one way to be black. And she decides she wants to be her own version of black as a part of the goth subculture. Again, every a good story is about helping people see a solution to a problem. And as I see it, if a book is about solutions, a person is going to learn something. Because the books, again, are supposed to open us up so that we can learn more about things, and it's supposed to help us get information that moves us forward. When you keep rehashing the same problems all over and over again, 
it just leaves the people stagnating instead of growing. And when you have a book that continues to talk about how black people are victimized, it does not lead to them making steps to become the survivors and then eventually become victors in their own lives. The third question she proposes is that there are heavy mentions of victims of modern police brutality such as Eric Garner, Black Lives Matter movement, and etc. Why do you believe these perspectives are so heavily represented and not many counter voices? Well, the main reason why these perspectives are heavily represented is because they fit the narratives of white liberals and it also fits the view of many blacks such as pro-blacks, hoteps, and many black activists such as Al Sharpton, Louis Farrakhan, and many others. And on both sides, they're looking to push this narrative for their own ulterior reasons. When it comes down to this white liberal, he's pushing this narrative of black victimization because it makes him feel comfortable. And it makes him feel comfortable because when it comes down to this white liberal, he is one of the biggest racists in the room. And because he's a racist, he's really insecure about being around intelligent, responsible, capable black people. So he wants to create a narrative about black people that makes him feel comfortable. And when it comes down to this white liberal, he likes to see black people as these poor, miserable, downtrodden victims. As long as this black person is a victim, he's comfortable with them. So whenever he sees an image of a black person or a concept regarding black people where they are down on the ground, such as an Eric Garner or a Michael Brown or Trayvon Martin, he's going to make efforts to push this heavy in his media because this is the story that fits his narrative. This is the black man he wants to see in his narrative. He does not like seeing intelligent, hardworking, conscientious black men in media because those men represent ideas that refute many of his concepts and, and values regarding black people. Moreover, seeing these black men intimidates them because they represent the whole concept of competition for him. So this white liberal just doesn't want to see any sort of counterpoint because the counterpoints that would present are presented refute many of the ideas and stereotypes he has created about black people. When it comes down to this white liberal, he needs these stereotypes, again, to feel comfortable and secure in himself regarding his manhood and the white liberal female needs to see them about her womanhood because they, they want to be able to fit people into boxes. And it goes back to that point I said about the spellbound Negro and fitting into that box. And when it comes down to these African Americans, they want to fit into that box because they want to get the attention from these white liberals and the approval of these white liberals. And that's why many of these African Americans out here, such as your Al Sharptons, your Louis Farrakhan's, your Jesse Jackson's, and many others, want to push this narrative and push the story of black victimization in the media. And this is why it's so heavily represented, because this is a point that is going to get them the attention of white people, the favor of white people, and the approval of white people. And moreover, many of them use this as a race hustle to get money out of white people. So a black man being a victim for them is a cottage industry. As long as there are black male victims, they can continue to go back to white liberals and get money for government programs or social programs or donations to their nonprofit organization. Black victimization is a big business. It's a very profitable business. And that's why we don't see many counter voices because counter voices pretty much are a competition and a threat to their cottage industry. Whenever somebody presents a counterpoint to these views, that's when the white liberals and the, most importantly, these black leaders have a problem with it. When, if you were to present counterpoints like I do in novels such as The Spellbound and Spinsterella where I show African-American goths or a story like The Thetas where I show you, you know, a black sorority that does not fit the narrative, these guys are going to get upset because they see a threat to their financial situation. Moreover, they see someone who may get the attention of white people 
and get their attention and approval and they want to be the head Negroes in charge and because they want to be the head Negroes in charge they continue to perpetuate and push this black victim narrative as the only narrative in the black community they don't want a counterpoint because if there is a counterpoint people are going to start looking at them and asking them hard questions such as why don't you help push this in the black community why don't you want to support this in the black community and they don't want to do that because that's a threat to their financial situation they can't make any money if there are no black victims and they can't make any profits if there are no black people thinking like victims the fourth question she proposes is that the book is supposed to be a letter from the author to his son and would suggest that to grow up as a black male in America you are going to be a very at a very big disadvantage and therefore less likely to succeed do you believe that this could be a self-fulfilling prophecy yes I believe it could become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you focus on it and I find that the constant focus on racism and all the disadvantages that black people teach their children to look out for often leads to them winding up with a hyper focus on white people instead of focusing on being the best black person they can be and because they're so focused on racism and white people it leads to them living their lives looking out for an evil white man instead of going out to live for themselves and while they live their lives like this looking out for white people it prevents them from actualizing their potential and that's how it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you're worried about the disadvantages of being black <clears throat> you're not focused on the positives of being black you're not focused on being the best black person you can be and what you're doing again is creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where you wind up becoming someone who pretty much is this black person who winds up becoming this black person who just is becomes disadvantaged and unable to succeed because you're spending most of your time focused on somebody who's out to make you a failure instead of being the most successful person you can be and this is something you know I wrote about about seven eight years ago on a blog talking about this whole concept of self-fulfilling prophecy because oftentimes African Americans spend so much time focused on looking out for an evil white man or a bunch of racists out to get them that they don't go out and go and get what they want and live the life that they want to live they don't go out and focus on the goals that they want to pursue in life and they use this concept of um, looking out for all this evil as a way to not do good and when it comes down to this hyper focus you know it leads to that self-fulfilling prophecy because you are so focused on failure that it eventually leads to you failing in life yes there is racism out here yes there is white supremacy in the world but you can't let that impede you and let that prevent you from being the best person you can be and being the best black person you can be because when it comes down to this whole concept of racism again yes it's out here but you cannot let that be the thing that impedes your growth you can't let that prevent you from being a person yes I am aware of racism out here I'm aware of white supremacy but I'm still going to go out here and persevere and be the best Sean James I can be and I urge people to go out here and be the very best person they can be the fifth and final question she proposes is that do you believe that there is a lack of different voices in african-american literature and if so how does this hurt us well I truly believe that there is a lack of different voices in the african-american genre and it really does hurt us because when there are a lack of voices out there it prevents people from seeing the bigger picture of african-american history and african-american culture and because we see a very limited picture we don't get to see how broad and how large african-american culture truly is when we have african-american literature that pretty much fits a singular narrative all it does is it prevents us from seeing how rich our culture truly is um, when it comes down to most modern african-american literature 
we only get a handful of stories regarding the black community and the black experience. It's easy to find books about slaves, poor, miserable, downtrodden Negroes on welfare, single, successful black women who can't get a man, street lit, or these days, stories about black women who are having interracial relationships with white men. And all of these books pretty much fit the white liberals' victim narrative regarding African Americans. And when I would go to the bookstores, such as Barnes & Noble, you know, or I'd go on Amazon, I would look at these books and it would just get repetitive, redundant, and boring. It's the same stories all the time. And I know that African American culture is a lot broader than what is presented on most bookstore shelves. And this is why I make my own efforts to publish my own works through the SJS Direct Publishing imprint, because I want people to see a larger picture of African American culture and see different African American experiences. And I do that because I understand that having a diverse selection of fiction out here is going to open people up and it's going to get them to see more about black culture and it's going to open people up to see that there are black people who want to do other things. For example, I know that there are a lot of African American science fiction and fantasy fans. So this is why I go out of my way to write novels such as The Temptation of John Haynes because I want people to understand who are into, you know, fantasy such as, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Angel to understand that yes, there are there is a place for a black character in this kind of story. And the reason why I would go out and do a black female superhero like Isis is because I understand that there are many black people out here who have said there is ne there have been minimal representation of African American women, you know, in fantasy and science fiction. And I wanted to create a heroine for little black girls to have for themselves. And I wanted to tell stories from an African American perspective that featured Egyptian mythology and fused African American history with it. Because I want people to see that, you know, there are different stories and different experiences out here. And that African Americans are pretty much, there's a whole host of different experiences people are having. And this is one of the big reasons why I wrote the two recent novels I did, Spinsterella and Spelldown, because I wanted African Americans to understand that, yes, there are African Americans who are a part of the goth subculture. There are African Americans who see things from a darker perspective. And that there are African Americans who have been living this lifestyle for many years. And I wanted to tell that type of story because, again, I wanted to give, peop to give those people in that subculture a voice, and I wanted to give them a character, and I wanted them to see that there are people out here who understand that they have, are a part of these lifestyles, such as African-American goth subculture, and there are black people participating in hobbies such as comic books, science fiction, and fantasy, and that there is a publisher out here who is willing to make an effort to produce products for them and, you know, give people that broader perspective and then give them products to go out and buy and support. And part of my efforts, you know, in trying to diversify this book market is to help black people. I don't, I want people, again, to get that broader picture of African-American culture and African-American and African-American experience because when you have a bigger picture of African-American culture, people don't want to put you in a box, they can't put you in a box, they can't put a stereotype on you, and they start seeing you as a human being. They start seeing you from, you know, a broader perspective, and that's really good for everyone because when we see people from a broader perspective, we start to walk away from stereotypes, and this is really good for black people because we, when we read books like, like a book like a Spinsterella or a Spellbound, or we start reading fantasy like the Isis series or the East Steam series, or a novel like the Thetas, which talks about African American sororities, or a screenplay like All About Marilyn or All About Nikki, which takes us into, you know, Black Hollywood or the life of a black girl in Beverly Hills. We start seeing that there are more there's more than one way to be black, and there is more than one, you know, way to live a black lifestyle. And that black people are living different lifestyles all across the country and even all across the world. And that's really good, again, for black people because we don't see black people as 
being one part, one mainstream, you know, there's one mainstream black culture, or there's one subscribe way to be black, such as a pro-black, or a thug, or a baby mama. We start seeing black people as people, and we start seeing black people from, again, a broader perspective, because that's what we want black people to be seen as. We want to see black people as people, that we have different ideas, different viewpoints, different experiences, and the more experiences that are published in the African-American fiction market, and the more stories that are told, the better it is for African-Americans, because, you know, African-American readers really need to start exploring, you know, outside of the mainstream boxes created by white liberals, and part of this is goes back to a concept I had in Spellbound where I talked about the darker shade of black, because the darker shade of black is the one not defined by white liberals or by, you know, black leaders, but the ones defined by ourselves. And when we define what black is, we establish what our culture is, we establish the foundations for it, and when we see that, that darker shade of black defined by us, what happens is we see ourselves for who we are, we define who, who we are, and when you have stories like I produce on the SJS Direct Publishing imprint, they open you up to see that there is a bigger picture outside of the traditional ideas for black people, the mainstream ideas for black people, and that you can be whatever you want, because that's part of what America's Constitution gives you, the right to a life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And as I see it, you know, when you have different voices, they open people up to understand the freedoms they truly have, because when you have these limits, you know, and in, lim in African American literature, Again, it hurts black people because it limits their view of themselves, their view of their culture, and prevents them from seeing themselves as they truly are or making efforts to actualize their potential. And good African-American literature, good positive African-American literature, like I produce, I believe it's going to open black people up to different experiences in black culture and allow them to explore, you know, the larger world of the black community and see those parts of the black community that most mainstream authors and most mainstream media don't want to talk about because it doesn't fit that victim narrative. And we really have to come out of that victim narrative if we hope to become survivors and eventually become victors. I really want to thank Kitty Candy for the opportunity to interview with her and answer her questions. And if you want to learn more about many of the books that I have written and published as part of the SJS Direct Publishing imprint, you can check them out on Amazon.com by clicking the link in the description box.